Okay, our last speaker this morning is Dr. Melanie Dubois, who's a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So Melanie is a wildlife biologist whose expertise centers on the interactions of wildlife and natural systems with agricultural landscapes. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Winnipeg and a Master's degree in Natural Resource Management from the University of Manitoba. And this is a certified wildlife biologist through the Wildlife Society. Her work has ranged from developing economic cost threshold values for pocket gophers and managing species at risk on PFRA community pastures to the use of geomatics to assess riparian health from satellite imagery. Assessing riparian health has led to the creation of a risk management of a risk assessment to identify the factors that predispose a livestock operation to predation, and now on to landscape scale pollinator resource assessments and BMP testing. So uh, we'll move on to Melanie's presentation. Okay, thank you very much. And, and, and I guess this is a part of Monty Python where they say, you know, now for something completely different, because it is going to be, uh, different, <laughs> not so much yield uh, as uh, looking at more of the natural areas. So let me share my screen. Yeah, so what I'm going to talk to you guys today about really is about pollinators in agroecosystems and how they interact and how they can impact your uh, yield and the overall resiliency of your system. Now, often when I say pollinators, uh, I say bees. So what I'm going to cover off is the basics of them, the role of uh, pollinators in habitat, how to support your pollinators, and then take a little bit uh, of a look at the gaps in knowledge that we have on these critters. Uh, sometimes people ask me why the focus on bees. Uh, there are other pollinators, of course, wasps, flies, uh, butterflies, moths, things like that. But uh, bees are a more dependable uh, pollinator. They actively collect and transport pollen. They eat it through their entire life. They feed it to their young. So they are very dependent on pollen. Uh, butterflies, moths, they really depend on their um, host plants when they're a caterpillar. And a lot of times they're a caterpillar for a lot longer than they are a butterfly. They also show flower consistency, which means certain guilds of bees are attracted to certain flowers. And that becomes important when you're looking at the components of habitat and resource within these areas. So this is kind of the straight goods on the slide. The most often, or the most often question I get is, okay, what's really going on with the bees? Uh, because there's a lot of information out in the press and sometimes it's competing or conflicting or not very well understood by the general public. So this is, this is kind of the, uh, all of it in, in one slide. Status of bees populations are declining. We're seeing that in all of our insects. I think the most depressing stat out recently is that we've lost about 70% of our aerial in insects, uh, which is deeply concerning, seeing as they're kind of that bottom of the pyramid on which a lot of things depend. So status is declining. Uh, some bees, we don't really know what's going on with them. Some are staying stable, stable and we don't really know why. Um, so we're trying to find out more about that. Here in Manitoba, there's been a real push lately to do baseline uh, studies, which we previously didn't have the capacity to do. So that's quite exciting that we're getting those done. In terms of trends, uh, trend is down. Some populations are staying about the same. Again, the concerning thing is we don't really know why some are being affected more than others. As for drivers of these uh, trends and these losses, we are getting a better handle on that. And I'm gonna address some of those drivers in terms of habitat loss, uh, pesticide use, disease transmission from domestic bees uh, and climate change. Um, before, you know, there was that thing, oh, is it cell phone towers and stuff, but we've pretty much put those to bed and we have a better handle on those drivers. Quite concerning though is thresholds. We don't know what the thresholds are. We don't know how badly we can impact our insects before we're all seriously in trouble. Uh, we have seen this happen though around the globe in terms of there are some provinces in China, they've lost all their pollinators. So they hand pollinate their fruit crops. Um, and you try and wrap your head around if we were in a state where we had to hand pollinate um, our crops uh, wouldn't really work out so well for the crops that we are dependent on. I'd like to talk about basic bee literacy. 
it's not great out there. And I think that it's really important for people to understand our bees. Um, oftentimes people think of two kinds of bees, honeybees or bumblebees, but there are a heck of a lot more. There are almost 20,000 species worldwide. Uh, and they have different pressures and different solutions for what's going on with them. The media doesn't really help us out a lot. Only about 15% of articles uh, mention native bees. Most of them wanna focus on honeybees. So I was mentioning we're doing a lot more baseline studies. So actually the number of species that we find here in Manitoba is upwards of now about 350 species. Um, it's not necessarily that our bees are doing awesome. It's that we have uh, experts available to us now. Dr. Jason Gibbs is one at uh, U of M. He's like the rock star for North America when it comes to um, taxonomy and identifying bees. So he's been a fantastic resource for us. So we're getting a better understanding of our bees, where they are and sort of what's going on with them by looking at past uh, records by historic uh, entomologists. Uh, yeah, we got about 24 species of bumblebee. When I go to egg shows, I always like to bring a box of bees so that people can see the, the variety of bees we have. We've got bright blue and green bees. We've got all kinds of stuff in it. And it helps the average person wrap their head around that, uh, that figure of over 350 species of bee. I focus on native bees, not European honeybees. Of course, European honeybees are considered livestock under the Agricultural Act. Uh, they do have pressures, but they are not endangered in North America. Uh, what's going on in Europe and other areas are a little bit different for our honeybees. Um, actually, the number of honeybees overall is going up simply because we can manufacture more, but it is getting more challenging for beekeepers are facing um, you know, issues with pathogens and disease transmission and, and things like that. But uh, we're not gonna talk too much about honeybees uh, simply because we're focusing on native bees and their interaction with crops and, and native uh, areas. And as I said, the problems for wild bees are different. I want you to think about wild bees more like deer, elk, polar bears, unfortunately which are having a lot of issues and our bees are having issues. So honeybees came from Europe. Uh, they're the only ones that make honey and they're the only ones that live in hives. Our native bees have a, a very diverse um, uh, life history. Uh, about 80% of our bees, uh, upwards of 90, are considered ground nesting bees and they are solitary. Now, when you are a ground nesting bee trying to make a living in Agro Manitoba, that can be very challenging because one of the things you need is undisturbed soil. So tillage uh, has a, a, an extreme impact on our ground nesting bees. Uh, about 20% of our bees are wood nesting. Uh, so they go in stems, they go in punky wood, things like that. Bumblebees account for about 1% of our, our bees. Again, there are about 24 species and they live in abandoned mouse holes and, and sort of tussocky grass and things like that. So I'll talk a little bit more about their habitat requirements as we go. So I did mention bees are in decline. Uh, you may have seen a stat. Oh, Albert Einstein says, uh, you know, if they die, we're gone in four years. It's, it's not necessarily true, but a lot of our bees are in serious problems and that has repercussions for us as we try to produce food, which is insect pollinated. So yeah, about one in four bumblebees are at risk of extinction. Uh, we already have one bee. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee has been listed and we have six up for consideration. But again, as I said, our, our baseline information on them is, is pretty limited. So we're really uh, just trying to get a handle on what's going on and it's challenging to figure out whether or not they're declining in areas where perhaps you haven't surveyed for them in a hundred years. I think this is something that most people know that pollinators really are critical to egg production and human health. You know, 70% of the main crops uh, for human consumption are dependent on insect pollination. Um, it's true things like wheat, oats, that type of stuff are not dependent on insect pollination, but where we do have uh, those needs are with our really nutrient dense foods where, where, you know, a good proportion of our vitamins and minerals come from. So it's, it's really critical and, and the value of them, of our insects to, uh, to our yields can't be overstated, you know, about $3 billion um, 
of value is, is contributed by insect pollinated crops. So as I mentioned, we'll survive, but a lot of health impacts, food scarcity, insecurity. People find this one really important. You know, we need uh, bees for uh, coffee and chocolate. So this is a, an example. I have to let my dog out. I apologize. All the joys of doing this from home. Eh? So our options without pollinators are really restricted. What's interesting about uh, what's going on with our cropping systems is that we've seen about a 300% increase globally uh, in demand for insect pollinated foods and crop acres have almost doubled. Uh, there have been a number, number of studies done looking at the different systems of agriculture and how vulnerable they are to the loss of their pollinators. And Canada and the US, we were sort of lumped together because we were similar. We tied for about fourth out of 15 or 16, sorry, of, of the systems they looked at. So that illustrates just how vulnerable we could be to the loss of pollinators. And when we're taking a look at, at uh, the innovations that we've seen in non-insect dependent crops, you know, due to breeding varieties or technologies with, um, with seeding or, or harvest or even water management, nutrient manage, all those kinds of things have really, you know, obviously increased our yield, but we're not seeing yields keep up in our insect dependent crops. And that's simply because we are starting to see deficits uh, linked to the lack of pollinators. So there was a study done recently, like this one was published in 2020, where they were looking at crop yields uh, down in the States. Um, and they found that, you know, about uh, five and seven pollinator dependent crops are showing um, yield losses. So what, what that means is they're in areas with uh, high dependency for um, pollinators, but the pollinators simply aren't there. So they are just not getting the yield that they should. A lot of people talk about uh, the honeybee industry. It is a billion dollar industry to move um, honeybees around. Uh, but unfortunately, honeybees actually aren't that great at pollinating certain crops. So when you're looking at wild bees, um, you know, you're looking at, at them being a better pollinator by a factor of uh, 1.4 to about 3.2. And that becomes important when, you know, your margins are getting thinner and thinner. Uh, what they're finding in a lot of areas, it's actually cheaper to increase your native areas to support your wild bees than to import honeybees, simply because of the changes in pollination efficiency, which makes sense, right? I mean, a honeybee, that's one species of bee. How can you possibly replace the efficiency of an entire suite of 350 different types of bee, right? You know, they, they perform differently at different times of the year uh, throughout the blooming time when you need them for different types of crops. So this was one uh, study that was completed recently. And this is Paul Galpern out of uh, University of Calgary. They've done some fantastic stuff when they're looking at the influence of pollinators uh, on crop yields. This was a, a long-term study. Well, it was about five years, uh, but quite large over 250 thousand kilometers of cropland and they really they found a positive um, increase in yield associated with uh, complex landscapes and when I say complex landscapes I mean they looked at the areas that had uh, you know shrublands potholes etc and what they wanted to really look at was um, whether or not a variance in yield could be explained by the landscape and then also by the pollinators that were present. And they found that, that yes, there was a positive influence. Um, it was small, you know, you're looking at three to 4%, but what was also important is that, uh, you know, they didn't see negative association to crop yield with these more natural areas. And when we're trying to um, promote retention of semi-natural vegetation, say for carbon sequestration or to act as biodiversity refugia or as uh, erosion control, we really wanna make sure that these areas aren't having a negative impact uh, disproportionate to their size on the landscape. And that positive yield um, increase was actually quite distance dependent. And I'm gonna talk about habitat fragmentation and why that might be because Anytime you get the habitat farther than about 800 meters, 
um, it's just too far. <laughs> the bees just don't fly that far. Um, you know, and then by the time you back the natural areas more than a hundred or more than a thousand meters away, you actually start to see negative impacts on your yield. So, of course, different crops have different dependencies on insect pollination. You know, often we bring in managed bees, not just honeybees, but leafcutter bees are very, uh, you know, familiar to most producers. They're, you know, hybrid canola seed is, is dependent on these insect pollinators. Um, some of the studies that we first started doing here at Ag Canada focused a lot on canola. Uh, and this association is a little better understood. And for some of the other crops, you know, you see that uniformity in seed set uh, is, is, a, is a big one. Um, you're seeing a higher bump in yield if you have a nutrient limited or sorry, nitrogen limited system. Now, this this is a question we get asked a lot about is like how much is enough, right? How much habitat do you need to see this bump in yield? <clears throat> what we did find is that uh, you see an increase of about 1.1% 1, 1 .1 in your yield for every 1% of, uh, of crop area that is converted. So we don't promote taking, uh, you know, really productive land out of production, but we do also have to understand that you are going to see increases in yield over and above what you lose. So some of the other um, uh, studies have, have said about 30%. And when we say 30%, again, it's not take 30% of your land out of production, it's take a look at the land around. You know, do you have shelter belts? Do you have, what, what do your ditches look like? That type of stuff and try and make up that 30%. And I'll talk about that shortly. I'll touch on this quickly. Causes of pollinator de uh, declines. I mentioned climate change, pesticides, I'm not going to talk to you about neonics today. That's a whole other <laughs> uh, talk in itself. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the habitat loss and fragmentation. We do have to appreciate that diseases and parasites are transmitted from our managed bees into our wild bees, which becomes a huge problem. Because of course, if a hive of honeybees gets infected, you can treat them, you can destroy them if you just can't treat it. But uh, once it gets into our, our native bees, uh, there's nothing we can do for them, unfortunately. Sometimes it's hard for people to understand what those climate change impacts might be um, on our on our wild bees. Um, uh, really, it has to do with plant phenologies. Uh, different bees come out at different times of the year, and they're really intricately linked with when their flowers come out, right? The ones that they evolved with, the ones that they need in order to have that good uh, food to feed their young, etc. And what we're seeing is the flowers are blooming at different times and they're starting to desynchronize from when their bees come out. And that's an issue on both sides. The plants need their specific pollinators and the bees need specific food. It's all part and parcel, right? So overall, one thing to always keep in mind is the amount of suitable habitat really is the main driver of pollination potential in these agroecosystems. So without the habitat, you're not gonna have bees. That's, that's really actually the simplest way I can put it. And when we're thinking about that habitat, that habitat has to provide certain things. You need suitable nesting and overwintering substrate. As I mentioned about 80 to even 90% of our bees are ground nesters. That means they need protection from tillage and the pesticides, right? And they need access to forage season long. They need stuff to eat all season. For example, bumblebees fly from, you know, April until October. Sometimes people point out, well, we've got these mass flowering crops, right? It's like, mm, sorry, that's just not enough. For example, this chart here shows you in blue the uh, blooming time for canola. It's like, okay, so then what are the bees going to eat? outside of that blooming time. So that's when those natural areas become really important because if you have an insect dependent crop, you are gonna want those bees to be able to survive through your crop rotations, right? Because you might not always have them present. You don't always need that, that insect dependent uh, crop, but you need the bees to be there when you wanna plant it. 
So when you're thinking about how this habitat looks on the landscape, and, and quite a bit of our stuff is, is focused on looking at this, is that habitat fragmentation becomes really important because not only are bees dependent on nectar and pollen, but they are also what's called a nest-centric forager, which means they really don't wanna go very far from their nest. And when you start thinking about the different sizes of bees, you know, this is where things get really kind of interesting because I mentioned one of the things that got Ag Canada into looking at native bees and stuff had to do with dips in yield and canola because we were seeing dips in yield right in the center of, of the crop that were not linked to variety or water or, or um, soil differences, anything like that. And it turned out to be just as simple as guess what? A bee will only fly so far, right? And it's very dependent on the size of your bee because it's 400 meters, right? To the center of a, of a quarter section. Well, a small bee, which actually makes up most of our bees in Manitoba, it can only fly about 50 meters, okay? When you're getting up to say a medium sized bee, like the max they will fly is 700 meters but they absolutely don't want to. Think about yourself when you're getting groceries, how far do you want to go? When you think every time you have to go somewhere, then it's costing you energy. You are vulnerable to predation or wind events or all these kinds of things. To provision one cell and one larvae, uh, the average leaf cutter bee takes about a thousand trips, right? So start thinking about how many trips your average bee needs to make to make one other bee. And when you start thinking about these large blocks, which are just not habitat, they provide neither nesting material nor food for these bees, they are absolutely dependent on your margins and you're gonna get fewer and fewer of them flying into the field because they can't live in the field because tillage, right? So you gotta keep this in mind when we're thinking about where the habitat is. Uh, one thing that we do at Ag Canada is we produce these maps which show wildlife habitat capacity on ag lands. And so we take a look at, okay, how are these ag lands able to provide for different species of wildlife? We look at about 588, I believe is the number of different species that we look at. Um, in this case, red is, is not good. Of course, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a cut just to Manitoba, but I think you can identify the Red River Valley. <laughs> which is the really red spot. And, and we do recognize that these areas um, are, are really intensively used to produce food for humans, right? But we also have to understand that the food for humans are also dependent on functional resilient ecosystems around them. And they are getting more and more degraded to the point where they are just not providing for things like pollinators on which our systems depend. One of the things we're trying to do is use habitat as a proxy for pollinators. I mentioned that, you know, it's it's, it's challenging for us to do the baseline surveys. Uh, really is very intensive um, sampling, expert opinion is needed. So we are looking more and more to habitat and the, and the assessment of the resources to be able to tell us where our pollinators are because then what we're hoping to do is overlay, for example, this model was developed by Environment Canada. So it's a pollinator potential index. In this case, blue is, is not good on this. So what we're seeing, for example, in the Red River Valley is low pollinator potential in areas that have high intensity land use and that are dependent on pollinators. So what we can use these uh, habitat maps for is to guide us, to tell us, okay, here we have crops that need pollinators, but the pollinator potential is low. So we need to start targeting that area for habitat installation and, and management of the habitats that are still there to try and get us a little bit better habitat so that we can actually grow the crops we need. So to do this, we're looking at various uh, habitat assessments, taking a look at, okay, what is already out there? This is an example from Xerxes. They're an, uh, a conservation organization down in the States. It does a ton of work on pollinators. So we're modifying this for Manitoba. We look at landscape scale vegetation, but then we dig a little deeper. We look at, okay, in the natural areas, what type of forage is available? What nesting habitat is available? And then we look at management practices. So we take a look at, okay, what is your pesticide use? Do you use treated seed? 
what does your tillage look like, that type of stuff. And we produce maps that look like this. This uh, particular map represents an area that has a high um, degree of pastures around it. So tons of, of uh, forage available for our bees, but you know, it's, it's kind of unusual in certain areas. Most of our areas look like this, right? Where you have very little uh, available for the bees to either eat or places to live. Um, which can uh, and will start to uh, impact yields overall. So when we're talking about how we can support our pollinators, um, as I mentioned, we're not talking about taking stuff out of production. We're talking about uh, looking at what you have and how can we increase the benefits to pollinators in those areas, because it's got to be economically viable, right? Uh, I don't think for a minute that you know, unless it's a really uh, unique circumstance, you're not going to be taking uh, land under production just for pollinators, but you might take certain parts out if it's also carbon erosion control, water quality, that type of stuff. Uh, so within the Living Labs program, what we are also looking at is how we stack these benefits. If I put pollinator habitat in strips in an area, what does that do for your erosion control? What does it do for your water quality coming in and off your field? So I was mentioning though, habitat installation, it's got to have lots of consideration. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy planting natural habitat. Um, we're trying to come up with mixes that range from a pure native mix to something that's more agronomic, but you know, tries to give you a good, uh, good bang for your buck for your pollinators. We do have challenges, uh, you know, availability of plants. Uh, they're hard to plant. Um, it, it, when you're dealing with natives, it becomes an issue with weed control, that type of stuff. You know, but as I mentioned, we've, we've got all kinds of innovative ideas, even if it's just, you know, flowering um, shelter belts, uh, insect strips through it, cover crops are becoming more and more popular and we're doing a variety of uh, projects looking at, okay, how do we blend in cover crops? How do we augment pasture systems with flowering plants? to get as many flowers out there as we can get and some undisturbed land for those. I know I've been talking quickly, it's because I want to be cognizant of the time, uh, but gaps in knowledge, I think I've tried to sprinkle these through as, as we went. We really don't have good baseline maps uh, of our pollinators here in Manitoba. We don't have a good idea of their status or trends because we're just starting to look around. We're trying to understand more the impact of tillage on ground nesters. I mean, one thing we do know is that in areas with uh, zero tillage or strip tillage, you get about five times the number of pollinators, which if you're looking at gaps uh, in your yield, that can be really important. Trying to understand those uh, thresholds of disturbance and trying to develop appropriate and successful seed mixes for producers so that when we give a recommendation, we know how much it costs to put in and what type of management needs to occur in order for those plantings to be successful. That's Porta pollinators. Any questions? Thank you, Melanie. That was a great presentation. And um, I personally learned a lot and it's great to see those pictures of the bees. <laughs> And the They're beautiful. Provided. Their faces are gorgeous. <laughs> so we don't have any questions in the chat, but I was just wondering uh, for anyone that's interested in establishing some of the pollinator habitat or looking at, you know, adding new shelter belts, where is the best place to go for information on mixes or tree species to plant? Uh, there's a group called the Pollinator Partnership Canada, and they have produced some fantastic guides. Um, we are looking at putting out some of those materials ourselves to be specific to Manitoba, but for right now, they've already done it. Um, and yeah, when you, when you look on their website, it's called Pollinator Partnership Canada, and they have guides specific to uh, uh, Aspen Parkland and Manitoba Lowlands. And so the species that they are recommending are specific uh, to those, those eco zones and, and good for our area. So they're a good place. You can always contact me. We don't do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff um, with producers unless they're in our living labs uh, watersheds. That being said though, um, you know, we always like to talk plants and if you want help, we'll try and get you as much help as possible. 
Thank you very much. And I had a, a few questions just came in, so we'll just ask one question. I know we're late, late on time, but a quick question here is how important is a water source for these pollinators? Um, it's got to be important, but not important enough that it's often uh, identified as a as a sort of limitation for pollinators. Um, of course, it does become an issue if you have runoff from fields with uh, pre-treated seed because, you know, we know that those neonics are fairly um, mobile in the soil. Uh, so, you know, I know they're an issue with different things, but um, uh, not enough. I know we do talk to people in urban environments and say, yeah, you can put out a bee bowl, you know, with, with stones in it. But overall, in, in a more natural area, not so much a limiting step. Great, thank you so much for that information.